Good morning, and welcome to this conversation with US Ambassador to NATO, Dr. Julianne Smith. My name is Rosa Balfour. I'm the director of Carnegie Europe, and I'm delighted to have this conversation, which is your first public appearance since taking up this new position. Um, a few words just to introduce uh, Julie. Um, prior to becoming the US Ambassador to NATO, um, uh, you were a, a special advisor, senior advisor to Secretary uh, Blinken at the State Department. And you've had other positions in government um, as a national security advisor to Vice President uh, Joe Biden. Um, and in between, you've had also several stints in um, think tanks in Washington um, in, at the German Marshall Funds, where we also cross paths as colleagues, um, and at the Center for a New American uh, security. Um, you have written extensively on European security and on transatlantic relations, so this really seems to be um, a testimony to the work that you have been carrying out um, in this space. Um, you joined um, uh, this mission a month ago, and you've really had to hit the ground running because the drums of war were already beating here in Europe. But before we talk about the current situation, and I'm sure there'll be a lot that you'd like to share with us. I'd like to ask you about your mission. What are you aiming to accomplish here? Um, we've had four very difficult years uh, during the Trump period, uh, for NATO in particular, and the first year um, of the Biden administration has been characterized by high hopes, but also by some tensions, uh, for instance, over the uh, US withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, the AUKUS affair with respect to France. So can I ask you what your mission is, what your objectives are, and um, what is your role in the framing of re repairing transatlantic um, relations, as President Biden often puts it? First, let me say, Rosa, it's great to see you. Uh, we were colleagues for a brief period, as you noted, uh, at the German Marshall Fund. Terrific to see you in this new role, and not so new anymore. Uh, and it is wonderful to do this event with Carnegie. They do such great work here in Europe and uh, in many places, including back in Washington. Grateful to everybody who joined us today as well. In terms of the mission going forward uh, for the U.S. mission to NATO, I mean, first and foremost, I guess uh, the orienting principle is really what President or then candidate Joe Biden said mm -hmm. out on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. And you'll remember him speaking a lot uh, in 2020 and the year before that when he was campaigning about the importance of revitalizing alliances, making sure that they're fit for the future, that they're properly resourced, that they are looking forward to future challenges, uh, and that we maintain united uh, unity and consensus uh, across the alliance. So that's principle number one. Principle number two is we're obviously looking ahead at the Madrid summit, which will be this summer. And we have uh, a long list of tasks to take on, most notably the alliance, as you know, and I'm sure those dialing in know, the alliance has set a course for itself to draft a new strategic concept. That's something that's only done once every 10 years or so. And in this case, there's a lot to take on in terms of new challenges. Increasingly, the alliance is talking about tech and AI, quantum computing, emerging and disruptive technologies. The alliance is doing more in the space of climate change and climate security. The alliance is talking a lot about the Indo-Pacific and China and has done some exceptional work in that space over the last two years in, in particular with more to come. And we'll have to have conversations about resourcing as well to make sure that that the new level of ambition is matched with proper resourcing. And we can get into that later uh, if you want. And of course, we'll have to talk about Russia, uh, not just because of events over the last few weeks, but in part because the last time that the alliance looked at Russia, the world looked very different. Mm -hmm. We had a situation where I think many of us were more hopeful about mm -hmm. the path that Russia was on 
And over the last 10 years, we've seen a tremendous amount of Russian aggression and activities that I think the alliance find deeply troubling. So looking forward, getting the language and the strategic concept on Russia will be important. But many of those other new challenges that I mentioned will be a key part of the work on the strategic concept as well. And lastly, I'll just say, of course, we're going to be looking towards a new secretary general. And uh, Jens Stoltenberg has been remarkable in providing leadership for many years here. All of us are very grateful for that. But uh, we are now at the end of his tenure, or approaching the end of his tenure, at the back end of this year in the fall. And so there'll be conversations here in the Alliance mm -hmm. about looking for a successor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. So you have a very big strategic agenda, which has a sort of medium and long term horizon. But we also have very pressing challenges. Um, European, Europe's uh, security architecture is under threat. Um, there are multiple conversations taking place in different formats. US Russia today with a meeting between Blinken and Lavrov, um, but also the OSCE, NATO, um, Normandy formats. Um, there are all sorts of uh, formats through which um, the West is trying to de-escalate tensions um, with Russia. I'd like to ask you, um, first of all, maybe you can share with us some thoughts. Uh, you arrived here on the 8th of January and um, walked straight into a flurry of meetings precisely on this issue. So maybe if you could share with us some thoughts on this, but also what is NATO's specific role in this context, uh, bearing in mind that um, there are other formats as well, um, and I mentioned OSCE for one, um, and the fact that Moscow really wants to talk with Washington rather than with, uh, more so, shall we say, than with the other, under the other um, formats that exist dealing with European security. Well, in terms of NATO's specific role, mm -hmm. of course, Russia handed us two separate treaties. Mm -hmm. And one was directed at the bilateral relationship to address issues that they wanted to raise in the US-Russian context. And another one was very specifically directed at this alliance, at NATO, with very specific demands about how NATO operate in the future. They had very strong language and kind of a maximalist position on NATO's open door policy. Mm -hmm which we have made clear is not up for a discussion or negotiation. They also had a wish list that involved turning back time to 1997. And NATO allies have also made clear that we are not going backwards uh, with this alliance. So for that reason, we felt like we wanted to have multiple sets of engagements with yep. the Russians last week. And as you noted, there was engagement uh, bilaterally with the United States in Geneva, as there is again today uh, with Secretary Blinken. We wanted to have a NATO-Russia Council meeting. And we wanted to also focus some of these transparency issues, risk reduction issues, yep. in the OSCE channels for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. I think that was the right approach. I wasn't able to join the discussions in Geneva or the OSCE in Vienna, but I can give you a little flavor of the NATO-Russia Council. It was just, uh, I believe, my second or third day <laughs> arriving back in Brussels, uh, moving my family after moving my family over. It was nearly four hours. It went long. Mm -hmm. It went as expected. Um, I think we heard a lot of what we hear from Russians, complaints about Western behavior, going back in history, looking at a longer term relationship between the West and Russia, some accusations about NATO's encircling Russia, NATO's taking an aggressive posture. Um, they went through the usual items. I don't think anybody found anything that they mentioned surprising. I I guess what I found comforting and reassuring mm -hmm. was the airtight message that came back from all 30 allies. Mm -hmm. We could not have been more united in that moment. Of course, the Russians were trying to draw out individual countries complaining about you know, this country or that country or particular regions or neighborhoods. But no one really took the bait. No mm -hmm. one uh, decided to leave this kind of consensus message that mm -hmm. we had agreed on uh, in advance. And really to watch 30 allies sit around the table and maintain the same demeanor, calm, direct, uh, firm, mm 
And what was most important about that engagement was not just to respond to what Russia had said to NATO in its treaty, mm -hmm. but the allies took the time to outline our collective concerns about Russia's behavior, mm -hmm. what Russia did in Crimea, about Russia's presence in Georgia and Moldova, about Russian acts of intimidation, the aggression that they have shown towards us. Uh, and that was an important exchange. That's part of the reason why it took so long. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us had a lot to say. But uh, it was exactly the way it needed to be, mm -hmm. a united, firm message of resolve in that moment. And I think if the Russians were looking for disunity or some disruption or someone dramatically walking out, none of that came to pass. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment of pride, frankly, mm -hmm. for, this, for this alliance, really mm -hmm. quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. You know how hard it is with 30, I mean, even 30 people in a room yeah. to always be united, even if you're, you know, 30 people trying to pick a restaurant for dinner. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's complicated, yeah. obviously. But in that moment, I think Wendy Sherman, the Deputy Secretary of State, said it best in her closing argument. She was the last person to speak. You know, you came here, you see that there are 30 at the table, but we don't speak as 30, we speak as one. And, and that was the bottom line, most important message to go back to Moscow. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's very interesting that you say this, and perhaps later we can discuss whether, you know, whether and the extent to which um, this type of aggression actually pushes convergence, because we have come from a period of divergence, of lack of unity, um, and just to name a few examples, for instance, um, the other day President Macron spoke about the need for a European dialogue with Russia at the European Parliament, which was interpreted in some quarters as perhaps going against this attempt to find unity. Um, in Europe, again, uh, been, there's been talk for the past few years of greater European strategic autonomy, um, very much as a consequence of the Trump years and the feeling that uh, Europe was being abandoned by its um, greatest ally. Um, but still we see that within Europe and among NATO members, there's some reluctance to go down that path precisely because there is a privilege of the transatlantic relationship. We've also seen other instances, for instance, Turkey buying S-400 missiles from Russia. Um, so within NATO, there have been several instances of disunity, and it is likely um, that one of the um, uh, reasons, uh, uh, motivations guiding uh, Russian strategy is precisely to try and divide allies. So um, can you perhaps elaborate a little bit. To what extent is uh, a pro disunity within NATO a problem? And to what extent can this newly found convergence around this aggression can be capitalized upon uh, to strengthen NATO's role in the security architecture in Europe? You're absolutely right. One of the goals uh, I think that we see in Moscow is to drive disunity, break consensus mm -hmm. across the NATO alliance, and they've done that for a very long time using a whole array of tools. And I think in this moment, again, what's remarkable is they're not succeeding. The allies mm -hmm. are aligned in their view of what Russia is doing, how we need to respond to it, why we need to be prepared for all contingencies. But yes, are there different perspectives in this alliance? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you just look at the United States. I mean, does Maine look at the world differently than California? Sure. Um, so anyone who knows NATO, they know that different allies bring different perspectives and views. But what's critical at this moment is that we are united on what Russia is doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. We are united in our response. We are united in pushing for dialogue and diplomacy, but also preparing for contingencies. And that's the most important thing that's going on at this juncture. But yes, throughout NATO's history, we've had moments of disagreement. We will continue to have moments of disagreement no doubt. But what I find remarkable about this alliance is when it counts, the allies come together with one united view. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, we do stand uh, mm -hmm. united. I found that very reassuring, again, in, in the NRC. On your other point about the European Union, 
all of us have made clear that different institutions play critical roles in this moment. We've seen the G7 engage when it's been absolutely critical, OSCE, NATO, the European Union, particularly on this question of sanctions. Very important right now to have them engaged. I think the EU is closely lashed up with the United States on that front. So in this moment, what is speaking of unity, there's unity inside institutions, but what's also been an interesting aspect of this is the unity across multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing these institutions that, you know, sometimes debate each other who gets to handle what thread and in this moment, again, there seems to be this sense that there's a role for everyone. Mm -hmm. There's a role for each institution and that we're going forward with a concerted approach that covers soft security, covers hard security, and everything that falls in mm -hmm. between. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think this gives me also a good cue to move into what you mentioned earlier about making NATO fit for the future. Um, you talked about sanctions, you talked about hybrid threats. Um, and there is, for instance, um, a NATO-EU cooperation, which um, can be very relevant in the context of cyber. Um, so um, how can we, you know, how can NATO address, what is NATO's role um, in addressing these issues that are not classic security, traditional security and territorial defense, but actually reaching out into other areas? And you mentioned also earlier uh, new technology, artificial intelligence. Um, can you perhaps elaborate a little bit more on, on this? What, what, what is NATO trying to achieve? What role is it trying to carve out? And how can it work with others um, in order to um, improve the quality of uh, transatlantic security? As I said in my congressional testimony, uh, in my confirmation hearing, the most amazing story about this alliance, or the key theme for me, is one of adaptability. Mm -hmm. So there have been so many different phases in NATO's history. We obviously had the Cold War, where the alliance was clearly focused on the Soviet threat. But since the wall fell, you've seen so many interesting iterations of the alliance adapting to mm -hmm. new threats and challenges. Of course, in the think tank world, and I think I might have been guilty of this from time to time, we like to occasionally write a wither NATO report. Is it relevant? Do we need it today? But the way in which NATO has responded to the changing threat environment is to continue to adapt, develop new tools, new doctrines to mm -hmm. respond to these new challenges. So we've had through the 90s into the 2000s countless examples. You know, we have now a situation where the alliance is talking about cyber as a new domain. We're talking about space as a new domain. We're increasingly talking about any potential vulnerabilities that might come as a result of of artificial intelligence. We're talking about the importance of maintaining our technological edge mm -hmm. so that we can remain competitive and respond to an array of threats. But we're also talking about new partnerships because as you noted, I think what you're getting at is mm -hmm. that some of these new threats drift into a new areas where we need partnerships. So let's take disinformation. Mm -hmm. Disinformation presents a security dilemma for all of us in the alliance. Mm -hmm. But similarly, the European Union also recognizes the same thing. And so as both NATO builds competency in this space and as the European Union builds competency in this space, we want to ensure that these two organizations are talking to each other, sharing lessons learned, bringing new tools together. Mm -hmm. and so so as we look at things like tech or cyber or hybrid challenges, we'll want to focus on partnerships, not just with other institutions, but also with other countries. You know, it's interesting for us to now go to Australia or to our friends in Japan and elsewhere and talk about how do you cope with some of the challenges that China's presenting as the systemic competitor? What can we learn from our partners? Mm -hmm. And so the way forward for NATO will be to continue to move out on tools and doctrine and strategy, but also to pull lessons learned from other institutions and mm -hmm. from our partners. Mm -hmm. And that'll be a key part of what we're doing in 2022 and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you more questions on this um, and how NATO is rethinking and reinventing itself in the 
present um, context. Um, but I'd also like to encourage our audience um, to send in questions. Uh, you can ask directly questions to um, Julie's and I'll relay them uh, to, to her. So please do not hesitate uh, to do that. Um, so we've talked about areas um, of interest and here there's one more issue that I'd like to ask you. Um, but then I, I would also like to ask you about other threats. Um, we talked a lot about um, uh, Russia. I'd also like to ask you about other threats. But amongst them is also the climate crisis. And uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg has actually invested quite heavily um, on finding a role for NATO um, in addressing the, the, the um, climate challenge. Um, this presumably will play a role also in the strategic concept that is going to be uh, decided at the, at the Madrid uh, summit. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on the climate issue? And also from a US perspective, mm -hmm. um, because many of the European allies are quite far ahead on the climate agenda and for the US is a bit of a late comer, shall we say, uh, to this issue. So can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? It's interesting. Um, I understand there's been, um, you know, Europe's been watching Washington closely in terms of our broader climate policy. But in terms of national security and climate, in terms of looking at climate change as a national security challenge, I actually consider the United States to be a leader in that regard. Mm -hmm. I, as you know, uh, worked in the Pentagon. Uh, many years ago. Uh, but even in those years, we were talking with colleagues about climate change as a national security challenge. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, I think the United States and its allies recognize that this can present security dilemmas and challenges for us in many places, most notably the Arctic, where mm -hmm. melting ice is yeah. going to change the entire dynamic. We're going to see more ships flowing through that neighborhood. It's in a neighborhood that not all of us are familiar with. And in some cases, we have to develop new capabilities mm -hmm. in, in that regard. But climate, climate change can also lead to refugee flows. Um, we can see climate change create friction and conflict. Mm -hmm. And so increasingly, I think we're finding that allies and the United States want to turn to this as a key focus for this alliance. Just last summer, the alliance was focused on climate change. It has launched a new action plan on climate change and climate security. If you take a look at that, it kind of sketches out an architecture of where NATO believes it needs to do additional work. But whether you're talking about the Arctic or, again, how climate can lead to conflict, I think this will be a key part of the conversation mm -hmm. going forward. I don't find uh, really any ally in this alliance that isn't ready mm -hmm. and willing to work in this space mm -hmm. on climate change. Mm -hmm. So that will be part of our agenda mm -hmm. this year as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And before I turn to questions from the audience, I'd like to ask you an additional question. So we've talked a fair amount about Russia, and Russia remains identified as the major threat for NATO. But China has been gradually climbing up the agenda. And how exactly can NATO address the strategic challenge that China poses? Well, first and foremost, the NATO alliance conducted its first China review ever in 2019, and that was just to get some situational awareness, a better understanding about some of the challenges posed by China's rise. There, I think we heard the language that came out of that was that there were challenges and some opportunities. Fast forward to the summit last year, and you saw more wording on the China challenge that China posed a threat or a challenge to the rules-based order. So increasingly, NATO is asking itself, how should we think about the challenge posed by the Chinese, by China in particular, and whether or not we're talking about the modernization of their military, the fact that they're trying to offer an alternative model to democracy, the fact that they're making some big investments in and around NATO territory yep. that could, in the future, create some vulnerabilities, or whether we're talking about, in some cases, economic coercion, or lastly, like Russia, some instances where they're looking to divide transatlantic unity. 
we all are at a point now where we agree that this is something that we should talk about at 30 inside this alliance. Mm -hmm. Now we'll have to see what the language ends up looking like in the strategic concept, but I fully anticipate that there'll be a reference to this challenge with some more details on how we should move forward in building capacity to address that particular challenge. We're also, lastly I'll say, we're looking closely as an alliance at that relationship between China and Russia. Yeah. In some cases, there's some learning going on. Yeah. I think sometimes we find that China's picking up on some of the hybrid tactics that yeah. are used by their friends in Moscow. So we want to keep an eye on that as well and understand how that particular relationship affects our security here in Europe. Yeah. And really among all our 30 mm -hmm. allies. Yeah, I think probably the nature of the changing nature of the relationships between Russia, China, Turkey, Russia are big, um, uh, big challenges uh, for NATO and they, they shift the geopolitical picture. So um, a few questions have started to come in. Great. I'm going to start with one that actually refers to an article that you wrote for the Center for a New American Security on charting the transatlantic course okay. to address okay. China. And uh, this is from Paul Hoffheinz, who's the president of the Lisbon Council, who says your article was excellent. Oh, so <laughs> thank how you. does the Russia <laughs> crisis play into that? So I'll ask you to think back to, to your article and... Um, you know how how can how can how can the Russia crisis play into that? And I think we've said a few words about it already. Yeah, if it's the report I'm thinking about, we had tried to do some work years ago, uh, both between GMF and CNAS, thinking about ways in which we could sketch out a broader transatlantic security agenda to deal with the challenges posed by China. Mm -hmm. And the report looked at. Uh, the area of trade and investment, but it also looked at challenges to global governance. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that there was a whole separate chapter on tech. And in that case, you see that there is a role for the NATO alliance in that tech space. Again, we want to ensure that we're maintaining our technological edge, that we're protecting our networks against any cyber challenges, uh, that we're thinking about these new technological or disruptive technologies, I guess, we refer, refer to them as such. But we also want to think more broadly, again, about NATO's partnerships with other institutions. So how could the NATO, NATO and the EU work together on the mm -hmm. China challenge? In terms of where Russia fits in all of this, I mean, obviously, we are very focused on the challenge at hand. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that this alliance can't do two things or three or 10 simultaneously. What's interesting about this body, it's so big. There's so many meetings going on simultaneously. We find our colleagues address Russian buildup right outside the Ukraine border, but simultaneously there are other teams meeting on the march towards the Madrid summit, and we want to keep that momentum going. Yeah. So I guess the only thing I would add is, is to come back to this question of the China-Russia relationship mm -hmm. and thinking about how those two alter or enhance each other's worldview, mm -hmm. what they do to position themselves to be in support. Uh, and we'll have to keep a close eye, again, on any lessons learned that they're sharing with each other on tactics. They certainly, again, share the same goal of mm -hmm. disrupting and breaking up transatlantic unity. But I feel good about the fact that allies are aware of those efforts and doing everything they can to counter them. Um, I have another question, which brings us back to Russia again. Um, and the question comes from the uh, EU NATO correspondent for Die Welt, mm -hmm. uh, Christoph Sch Schilt. Okay. And he asks, um, how realistic is it, from your point of view, that Russia putting pressure on the West to obtain the required security guarantees will not invade Ukraine, but will create problems elsewhere? And he mentions the Arctic, Syria, Libya. Are there such concerns in Washington, and are you prepared for these possibilities? I think it's safe to say that the NATO allies have learned a lot about the Russian playbook over the last mm. 10 years. 
they tend to follow a pretty similar pattern. They like to distract us sometimes with an action in one area while they're off to the races in, in another. For that reason, I feel like allies are very attuned to keeping up a 360 degree approach and outlook right now. All of our antenna are up. We do not assume that the focus should only be Russia, Ukraine. We're obviously focused on that neighborhood and what's going on there. But simultaneously, we're looking at challenges everywhere. We're looking at the Mediterranean, keeping a watch there. We want to keep an eye on the high north. We want to look at what the Russians are doing in their immediate neighborhood, anything in the Caucasus. We're watching Georgia closely, Moldova. Uh, so. All of us are very clear-eyed about the tactics that they use, mm -hmm. and it, it becomes, in some ways, um, a little bit predictable that, that this is a common mm -hmm. pattern for them. So I feel we're prepared. We're not only focused on one particular mm -hmm. area, but allies seem to be well aware of potential challenges in other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I suppose since 2014 especially, annexation of Crimea, there's been a bit of a learning curve in the West. There was a bit of a blind spot. The assumption that um, our strategic challenges would not work together, and that has changed, and now we're, we're seeing different patterns of cooperation. Um, and in this um, regard, let me ask you a question um, about Turkey um, in, in the context of the Ukrainian crisis, and if the Ukrainian crisis deteriorates further, um, it will be, um, what, what will Turkey's role be in this? Um, and how do you look at the situation from the point of view of NATO, with Turkey being a member of NATO, but also in the context that um, Turkey has entertained rather positive relation with uh, Moscow over the past few years, and perhaps that's the most um, obvious um, um, marriage, some say of convenience, some say it's a lot more lasting, uh, but also that Turkey and Ukraine have also been cooperating, especially in the military sphere. So how does that jigsaw puzzle uh, fit in, in your view? Well. Everyone who's dialed in today understands that the alliance in the United States, we've raised our concerns about the S-400 in very specific terms. And I think our friends in Turkey understand mm -hmm. that we're worried about questions of interoperability. And we would prefer if they had not purchased the S-400s. And that's a separate issue. Uh, but what's important in this moment is that Turkey, along with the other 29 allies, sat in that room last week and conveyed one singular message straight back to Moscow. No one was off message. No one decided to take a different path, a different approach, to send a different message to Moscow. And I, I hate to keep repeating that, but I think it's important that people understand that Turkey and everyone else sat at that table united, and I'm confident that we can keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Again, happy to always also admit that everyone brings a different perspective and different sets of relationships, but that's why it's so important and so remarkable that we were able to all sit there mm -hmm. last week and convey the same message. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not concerned at this moment on that, on mm -hmm. that unity piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but um, speaking again of allies, I'd like to focus on Germany now. So we know that uh, Secretary Blinken is in Berlin. Now there's a new government um, and there's several issues um, that have become difficult or perhaps which require uh, greater clarity. One is of course Nord Stream and Germany's role in case there is a need to trigger uh, sanctions of one sort or another. We know that the sanction toolbox is actually quite wide. Um, but also um, the question about to what extent is in light of Germany's uh, position um, and to what extent is NATO actually commit really committed to an open door policy. Now we've, we've heard it being reiterated and of course the principle is, is, is uh, not negotiable about maintaining an open door um, policy but um, in light of perhaps some cold feet in some countries, um, is it possible that there will be a de facto freezing of the open door policy? And I'm thinking in particular, obviously, 
uh, Ukraine and Georgia, which are the two countries that um, would like have it expressed an interest in joining. So. Can you say a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. Again, back to the unity yeah. point, there the message from NATO was very clear that NATO enlargement or its open door policy is really something that we will only discuss at 30 with the aspirant country, whether that's Ukraine and Georgia or another country. We've also mm -hmm. heard a lot recently from our friends in Finland and Sweden and their views on the open door policy and how much they value that particular mm -hmm. open door. Mm -hmm. We've heard crystal clear from the United States, but other allies that no one's closing the door, no one's crashing or slamming that door shut. Mm -hmm. I don't see any room for maneuver. Uh, the language and the community communique from the summit last year was also crystal clear. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be completely off the table in terms of Russia's demands to have some sort of uh, negotiation over that NATO policy. Mm -hmm. So that that is firm. I don't I don't see anything changing in that regard. I, I think the messaging has been very, very clear. Back to your question about Germany, uh, Germany is just a critical and important ally in this alliance. It's a, a large power in Europe. It's uh, an important relationship to the alliance, to, to the United States. You just saw the secretary, Secretary Blinken, was there this week, and this was the second meeting he had had yeah. with his German counterpart. We value what Germany is doing for this alliance, and we value the fact that we're all united in a common message, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about things inside the NATO alliance, like NATO's open door, or whether you're talking about sanctions and mm -hmm. our cooperation between the US and, and the EU. I'm excited for the new team. It's, it's an amazing star-studded cast of all sorts of uh, national security experts. We've yeah. got great counterparts, and I think the, the bilateral relationship is off to a great start. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So sure. let me just... Um, ask you one more on Russia, and then maybe you can go back to the theme of the resources. Yeah. Because we've uh -huh. been, we've yeah. been um, uh, mentioning it, but not going into great detail. So I think the question is, it's been very clear, and you've been very clear um, about where NATO stands, but also where transatlantic alliance, uh, 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 the transatlantic allies stand with respect to um, Russia. So what could help a de-escalation? What do you think... It could, where could that window of opportunity come from for Russia to back down on what are overwhelmingly seen as unrealistic demands? It's hard to predict what mm. is inside the Russians' heads. If, if It's hard to predict what, how Putin is looking at the situation at the moment. We have tried to keep the door open to de-escalation and dialogue while also messaging to them that they would face massive consequences if they choose another path mm -hmm. to further invade Ukraine. We have also tried, while we have said no to a number of their ideas, we have tried to lay out areas for a future conversation. Yeah. And in that regard, we have noted an interest in talking about risk reduction. Mm -hmm. We have mentioned an interest in talking about transparency mm -hmm. as it relates to exercises. Yeah. Could we do, you know, agree to better sets of notifications? Mm -hmm. We've talked to them about arms control, yeah. primarily in the bilateral space, but also the possibility of having NATO talk about arms control. Whether or not Russia is genuinely interested in dialogue is a question that all of us wish we could answer. Mm -hmm. We may know more in the days ahead. We'll have to see what comes out of the engagement today mm -hmm. with Lavrov and Blinken in Geneva. But I feel like in addition to saying no on the maximalist demands, we have given them a path towards diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to see if they seize on that, mm -hmm. that window. Thank you. And thank you also for being brief, because questions keep on okay. coming in. No, right. but they keep on yeah. coming in. So <laughs> let me just move on to resources. You mentioned that. And I was just realizing that 
perhaps it's an it's an observation and it's it's not empirically tested but perhaps we talk a bit less about the two percent and have moved on um what resources do doesn't it i mean not moved on in the sense it's still it's still there as a goal but perhaps the transatlantic discussion has become a little bit more all-rounded and 360 degrees about resources um what kind of resources do we need to make NATO fit for the future? I'm glad you raised burden mm. sharing. Mm. Uh, it's an important topic that we include in any discussion about NATO, and I don't want to give anyone the impression that the United States has got to let its foot off the gas. The Biden administration is crystal clear that it wants to ensure that allies are meeting that 2% target. We have until mm. 2024 when allies are supposed to meet that target. So we will continue working with allies to encourage them to do all of the heavy lifting they need to do to get there. We have another conversation, which is post-2024, what are we doing? on the question of burden sharing. And there, there are additional conversations that mm -hmm. we can be having. First of all, we got to make sure everybody meets it. If they don't, we'll have to work with the allies to develop a plan to get there as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. But most importantly, for those that did make it, how can we have additional conversations about force generation or readiness or capability gaps that still need to be filled? So we'll be having those tough conversations with allies, and there will be some work that we need to do now on the post-2024 space. Back to your question about broader resourcing, it is important that simultaneously we have conversations about NATO's own internal civilian military budgets and whether or not those budgets are aligned with the ambitions that we're setting out for the alliance. My mind is, and I think the mind of my colleagues back in Washington, I can say with certainty, is that we do not have the resources in NATO's budgets to meet the level of ambition that we've already sketched out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Some of the work in the 2030 report was extraordinary, and I think many of us support many of the ideas that were put forward in that research mm -hmm. and all of that good work that had been done prior. But in order to meet those goals, we're going to have to have some really tough conversations about common funding. And there are different perspectives there. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we can't reach a consensus view mm -hmm. and continue to move the needle. But part of our work, or my work, I guess, going forward in this mission is to stay focused on this question mm -hmm. of resourcing. Mm -hmm. Yes, level of ambition. What threats and challenges do we need to be tackling? But can we make sure that we've got the resources behind mm -hmm. it? Thank you very much, Julie. And I think with this, we need to bring this conversation to an end. It was fascinating. We really covered a lot of ground, and we could go into greater depth on all the topics uh, that you mentioned. But I think this really was a 360-degree conversation on the immediate challenges for NATO, uh, but also uh, the bigger picture looking forward. So thank you very much, uh, Julie, for your time. And I look forward to continuing to engage with you while you're here. I hope we can. It's mm -hmm. been a pleasure. Great to see you again, Rosa. Thank you.